This conference will now be recorded. It's going to start, and you may know Cindy from picking up her stuff at Farmer's Market. Oh, oh, a garden day. Yeah. No, it's a day. So Cindy does Farmer's Market. She's been a master gardener. She started in South Dakota, I think, probably. Oh, wow. And um, so she's going to start our program. Before everyone got one of these picked up, I want to give you a little shout out for that. So Dr. Ball is going to be coming and speaking. And I think most of you have seen Dr. Ball and he's our state tree person. And this may be his last visit to Yankton because I think he retires, if not the end of this year, then next year. So he's going to talk to us about trees, probably um, kind of touch on the Emerald Ash for a little bit, see where that's at. So that would be a real good program. You won't want to miss that if you have trees that you're growing or you're concerned about trees in the area. There's a few more zucchini left. So if you didn't pick one up and you want one, please help yourself. Marlis grew those and donated them to us. And um, so we know that they're good and healthy and, and, and uh, had the best growing conditions, <laughs> all organic. <laughs> so we'll get going on this. And we have session next month again, and that's going to be the last one for our season. And Marlis is going to be doing that one on preserving food. So we'll get going on this year-round gardening and see where we where we can um, get things green in the winter, right? <laughs> all right. So as Jan said, I'm Cindy Nelson. I'm the owner of the Garden Gate. Um, I've been a master gardener for 21 years. Um, I also have a degree in horticulture um, from SDSU. Um, I just got the master gardener program because I was working, I had my own business and people saw extension more than they saw me even when I got the degree. So that was the main reason I started, but I really enjoy being a master gardener. I mean, I, I like telling people about horticulture and um, I also work with the Boys and Girls Club with the Gardening Club program, and um, we also have the fourth graders, pre-COVID, we have fourth graders come out to our farm every year and teach them about farming and what we do. So I uh, was asked to come in and talk about year-round gardening as far as like fall planting and then also winter gardening because I do have a high tunnel on my farm um, because I, I also do sell produce year-round um, at farmer's markets. Tell everybody what that means, a high tower. High tunnel is like a greenhouse that you grow in the ground. So you have the, the blank dirt in the soil. You grow in the soil, but you have a structure like a greenhouse over the top. So um, I have a picture of a cold frame in here. I did not take a picture of my, I'm not very techie, so I didn't know how to take a photo and get it on there. So. I had somebody else even make the PowerPoint for me because it's been 25 years since I've done a PowerPoint presentation. So um, we'll get started with fall planting. So right now is an excellent time to plant uh, trees, shrubs, perennials. Um, I like planting more in the fall than I do in the springtime, uh, just because sometimes our springs are so variable, like especially this year, up, down, up, down. Um, in the fall time um, with the trees and shrubs and even the perennials, they have a longer time to establish roots and easier time to establish roots and easier to water them. But also your spring flowering bulbs like tulips, daffodils, and crocuses. Seeding and sodding lawns is easier. You don't have to water it as much. You don't have to water it all summer long to try and keep it alive. Um, and even some, the new thing is seeding cover crops and gardens. So I'll talk about that a little bit. And then even starting some fall vegetables. We can still do that yet uh, on a few things this time of year. So trees, shrubs, and perennials. This should be a reminder. Uh, just remember to dig your holes two times the size of the pot that you, you uh, purchased that plant in. And then I also loosen up the soil around the roots. Because if that tree has gotten really root bound in those pots, it will continue doing this in the soil unless you break up the roots a little bit. Sometimes I use a spade to do that. Sometimes I use a scissors, depending on what it is. And that way it just makes those roots 
go back out. It's not going to hurt the plants. It's kind of like root pruning is what it is, but it helps get the plant established faster. So even if the leaves fall off during um, due to frost, the roots will continue to grow on the plant. It's still going to actively grow the, the, the roots. And so that's why I like planting in the fall. Like sometimes this summer, I mean, if you see the lilacs are starting to bloom again, it's because they went dormant this summer. Same thing will happen to roots if it gets too hot. They'll just sit there. They're not going to do anything. You still have to water them to keep them alive. But around here, it seems like our ground doesn't necessarily freeze until the first of the year. So you have all that time that that plant is cooler, it gets more established. But you also need to keep watering it until that ground freezes. If they have lost leaves, you don't need to water as much. As long as there's moisture on the ground, you're okay. You don't want to overwater it. Um, one thing when planting, if you want to, you can use a root stimulator product to increase root formation this time of year. You can do it at any time, but if you want to, and it'll help it go into the winter better. Also, you can use a fertilizer, but just one that's higher in um, phosphorus and potassium, not nitrogen. Nitrogen puts on a lot of upgrowth. You just want the root growth is going to be your P and K. And just do it at planting time, just so we don't get too much fertilizer. Uh, I went to Baumgart just to see what I could find, and this is the only one. I don't know if you guys can see it. I'll kind of pass it around. It's got five, seven, and ten. So five is your nitrogen, seven is your phosphorus, ten is your potassium. So you want something that's going to just mainly work on those roots to get that more established. And then in the springtime, you're going to have a lot easier time getting it, it going as well. And I also got I've had this for years. I always forget to put fertilizer down or use them, but this is Root and Grow. It's got a 310 3. So, this one you just mix with water and you, you water the plant essentially with it. So, those are just two products that you can use um, if you want to. And you can also just throw some compost in the ground with it, uh, and that will work as well. I'm not a big fertilizer person just because I don't have the time. I think I got yes spring flowering bulbs so on the bulbs dig holes according to package instructions you may dig the holes a bit larger to just add some compost I was looking some information up on that they actually suggest compost or bone meal I had always heard bone meal but I found two different sources one from SDSU and another one from like Michigan State and they both suggested compost over bone meal hmm. Um, and with bulbs, if, when you make your holes, I usually make not just holes, I just, if I'm going to do bulbs, I'm going to do a section. So I just dig that whole area out down to whatever it says. And then I just put them all in and then I cover it back with my soil. Make sure that the bulbs, especially like tulips that are pointy, so the point goes up, not down. I did that once when I was a kid. I planted them all upside down. <laughs> did they I learn anything then? No, I didn't think so. Uh -uh. They didn't. I did that once. My mom just let me do it by myself, and I did it all upside down. So, so usually the flat part, because some of them are kind of hard to tell, you can sometimes see little root nodules on them, and make sure that just goes into the soil. The other side will go up. Because I think I want to say like crocus bulbs are a little difficult to figure out because they're not they're both flat on both sides. Uh, seeding and sunning lawns. To me, it's easier to do in the fall. Less watering is needed with the cooler temperatures to keep it established. Mm -hmm. um, and overseeding can be done to those lawns that have died out in spots or if the lawn is thinned out. And right now is a really good time to do it right now because we still have probably six weeks before our killing frost. Um, and killing frost is more like 26, 28. You might get a light frost, but the grass will still be okay and can absorb that. Um, on overseeding, we need to do it in spots in the yard from the summer. We've tried watering our lawn probably once a week because it was already starting to go dormant in May. We already seen it turning gray and going backwards. I'm like, oh, we can't go this long. Not watering our lawn, but we did lose some of it and I'm going to have to go in. And I, what I'm just going to do is just put the seed on top of the ground and just rake it and I'm going to leave the dead grass there for the mulch. And um, you can you can kind of tough it up if you want to, or rough it up a little bit beforehand. Throw just broadcast seed over it, and then um, scratch it a little bit more and water it in. So as long as you can get a good seed to soil contact, you're usually okay. 
you don't have to cover it all up. Is there any questions so far on that? I know that's probably a big thing right now is seeding the lawn. You can also dormant seed. Um, it's really hard to do here, but I had learned a long time ago that in the winter time, after the first snowfall, the go throw seed down if you're looking to overseed. And then that moisture from the snow will just keep it, it'll hold it there until spring, and then it'll come up when it's ready. But we don't have enough snow. Not lately. <laughs> now, not last year. I'm not sure. Only on those years, so it's kind of a hit or miss on, on those. <laughs> okay, and then we're going to talk about cover crops a little bit. So cover crops are, um, and I'll tell you some different varieties of cover crops here, um, can help build soil structure. It can help protect the soil from a loss of erosion. And it can assist in weed and pest control for the next season. So here is a... Uh, a mixed species of cover crops. This is more a clover than that picture. It's a little hard to tell. So you want to think of the timing of planting and which crops will fall out in the space next season. So <laughs> same thing. We're, cover crops need six, mainly about six weeks. You can use do some that are four weeks, like some radishes and stuff. Um, but a lot of things will take six six weeks to get a good good uh, space. So. Um, so yeah, you want to think of the timing of planting and which crops are going to follow the next year. So because some of the crops put nitrogen into the soil for you, and some collect nitrogen from the air, and then as they decompose, well, after they die off from the frost and break down, they'll put nitrogen back in the soil. So there's a couple different different ways. So I have radishes and cereal rice help with the weed suppression, and they also collect nitrogen and other nutrients. And then as they die, they will um, break down. And put nitrogen in the soil. Peas and clovers add nitrogen to the soil through their roots. They put uh, nodules on there and they will put it directly into the soil. And you also want to think of how much green manure we call it. You want to put back into your soil. Do you need some or do you need a lot? Uh, some things are very thick, you know, like where I was talking about cereal rye, it's kind of like wheat. So you're, you can get a fairly tall grass if you want to leave it there and then cut it back and let it um, have a lot of green manure. But if you do something like radishes, it's gonna be something short. It's not, it's gonna be more for keeping weeds down. It's not gonna turn as much organic you know, matter back into your soil. And like I said, you'll need about six weeks. Um, oops, frost. <laughs> then I get changed um, to get its biomass and red system robust enough to do some work in the soil. You can do one single crop or you can do a mix of different crops. So we do do some cover cropping out in the fields on the farm and we do a mixed crop, usually not um, a single. And I haven't, I've never gotten myself to stop growing in my gardens to do a cover crop in pot. I wanted to do it in patches and I just haven't done it or in my tunnel. Um, so there are different crops that will winter kill from the cold temperatures and others will we have to be terminated in the spring. So like your rice, actually that's what they like. They like that cold, they sit there, they'll come back and they'll start growing again next year. Peas could actually, um, winter peas could actually make it through the winter and you would have to kill them off. Um, so here's some different types of cover crops. We have like the cereal rye, the winter rye. Uh, tillage radishes, those are like the really big radishes. Your daikons, um, like your German giants. Yeah, they so the winter radishes, um, I don't I don't normally put watermelon radishes out there. We use turnips, uh, winter peas, uh, annual ryegrass, and that one will die. Uh, buckwheat will come back. I had that come back. Mustard, this is mustard, so it's really pretty yellow flowers. Hairy vetch, turnips. So what happens like with the turnips will die back your radishes will die with the cold um what they do is they leave like big voids you know they'll get to be like nice big holes when they break down and then you've got these voids in there but what it does in the springtime is you've got those holes the water filtrates into those holes and gets into the ground better than if you had like a flat pan of soil which is kind of cool and our cows like them too they ate them all winter long even when they froze, 
<laughs> uh, easier way to apply it is to broadcast the seed in the garden and then likely lightly rake it in. So same thing, seed to soil contact is important. Uh, you do need to like, you know, establish a bed. So you might have to retill it and then keep it moist to get it established and get it growing. So I, well, now we're gonna go on to fall uh, vegetables. So some things to do for, to try, I didn't put all the, the dates on them because there's different varieties. You would probably go with some of the shorter variety stuff this time of year, but like radishes uh, can be started now. Um, they will take it. They have a lot of these vegetables will take it down to like 24, 26, like your cabbages, your cabbages and your um, like broccoli, you can do broccoli, cauliflower. They'll take it down to about 24 degrees before they're going to freeze off. Um, your as well as kohlrabi, peas, radishes, your some of the leafy greens will take it down to about 28 before they will freeze. So even if we get a light freeze, you can and sometimes you can just cover them with blankets if you want to, and they'll they'll be fine. So we, what about beets? Oh, you can do beets too. How 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 cold will they take? 28, 28 to 32. So oh, they are wonder. They're 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 wonder is a 45 day one, so that one is one that would probably work the best this time of year. Um, carrots should have been in a little bit earlier because um, most of those are 60, but I did see that somebody said they still plant like the red core chatneys this time of year. I don't know if that's how you say that. Chantanay. Um, cabbages will take it down really cold. I've even seen some places say 18. You can take them down to 18. They can have snow on them, uh, especially Brussels sprouts. Um, so a lot of times you can harvest these all the way into December if you wanted to. So uh, one thing you can use is like a frost blanket. I was going to bring a piece of that. It's just like a really fine white woven material. And you can put that over the top of those crops if we think it's getting too cold. Um, I, I use those a lot in the winter, in the fall. So if you want to do some winter gardening, some things you might need. So this will be, you'll have to put, maybe put a little cost into it if you want to do it outside. So here's some uh, fancy little cold frames uh, that somebody's using to keep crops in there. And you can usually grow in there for quite some time, probably until you get into those teens and maybe a little less, because you're going to warm that, that soil up a lot faster and it'll stay warm in there. I also learned that if you put like a milk jug with water in there with your cold frame, it'll warm up during the day and it'll heat that whole area all night long. Mm -hmm. So Especially I know some time. places in tunnels, they don't use heat. They just put 55 gallon barrels of water in their tunnels and that will warm up the tunnel and keep it warm enough at night. So there's high tunnels. New thing is caterpillar tunnels and then low tunnels. Low tunnels are probably about two foot tall maybe three foot wide that you can just looks like a mini greenhouse you can put over the crop and it just keeps the you still do the same thing either plastic or a frost blanket on it and it would just stay uh keep keep the cover off from right on top of the plant so i um what's a caterpillar tunnel caterpillar tunnel they're probably about eight foot tall but they're very, they're a little more flimsy. They're, we don't use them here in that much in South Dakota because of our winds. Yeah. Yes. But I do know that the prairie, I think it's prairie roots produce and Freeman does use them. Mm -hmm. um, I saw a post that they were, they have some of them and it just extends the season. Um, but a lot of times what is happening is you're pulling your plastic and then all that extra plastic on the end just kind of goes like this and then they just tie it down. So it's not necessarily, they don't have any end walls. And so it's the same on the other side. And sometimes they just leave them open. They don't even have ends on them, just covers. <coughs> so I do, like on some of those vegetables, I've done spinach year round outside in the garden where I've just taken the frost blanket. I've, I've started it probably about September, October. I've gotten a couple, maybe some leafy greens off of it before it freezes completely. Put the frost blanket over and then I put straw on top of that or leaves. If you got uh, able to have leaves and it would hold it down. I take that off. I had a crop growing underneath in March. 
I pulled mm. it off and pulled it off and they had nice big leaves in there. It's like, wow. I was amazed. <clears throat> so that was before I even started with the tunnel. So gardening inside, it can be done. It's a little more tricky because sometimes the light levels are hard. But some easy things to start with are sprouts and microgreens. And because those are just in a very short period of time. So I started in a few sprouts. You guys can come up and take a look at them later. These were only done two days ago. They'll be ready in two to five days. And you can start eating them. So these are just the milk alpha sprouts. I have two different systems. So this is just in a jar with some cheesecloth and a rubber band. So I just open it up. I kind of fill it three fourths away full of water, put the cheesecloth back over, flip it over and let it drain. And then I'll let it drain till the water's all pretty much out and then I can set it back. I'll, if I want to, or a lot of times I forget and I- What happened? Uh-oh. I don't uh -oh. think it's anything you did. I'll go get it. Oh. So, so we're gonna get her. and then this one is actually a sprouting um, container. So there's one container, I, we have to let in the bottom yet. So I, <laughs> there's one that doesn't have holes, these other ones have holes all the way around the outside. And you put about two, what I do is I put one extra tray on top, I put the water there, so it filtrates down. That way it doesn't, because if you put water on top of the sprout, they're just gonna go like this, you know. So this way it just kind of trickles it down. And I have enough what I could do more if I really wanted to at a time. Never put the top on it when it's, when they're sprouting, because it, then it will get no oxygen. So I just leave that one tree on top of it at all times, and that way it keeps bugs out, flies, whatever, from from getting to it. But you can take a look at those. I was going to try and get some microgreens started. So microgreens are really about another week after that, and then they'll, they'll be about shoots like this, and you actually just cut them off. You actually grow them in soil or in some type of a medium, and then you cut them off. And usually you'll get another flush of them too. You can get a couple flushes of the microgreens. Um, oh, please tell me that my PowerPoint's not drawn. <laughs> <laughs> so we can do, um, you can do sunflower seeds, you can do alfalfa sprouts, broccoli, radishes, uh, wheatgrass, um, and you can just throw a lot of that stuff on soil, or in salads, sorry, um, or like wheatgrass, a lot of people juice it. It ran out of power. Oh, it's sweet. <laughs> it ran out of power. It ran out of power. What was it not plugged in? It looked like it was loose. Oh. Those gardeners were out of power. Yeah, everyone runs out of power. <laughs> <laughs> so I have some more pictures of some different, oh, when she gets it um, put up there, some different, there's different setups that you can do in the house if you'd like to. You, I mean, you can use a window if you got a self window. Um, if anybody has seen like the arrow gardens, um, or there's one I just found a click and grow, looks like a little really nice system too. And it can grow a little bit with it. So you can raise the light up like that arrow garden is kind of, you're stuck in that setup. But the lights on the other one, I think will move. Um, there's it's tower or vertical systems have really been popular. I have a tower garden. Yeah, I've got a, I brought a picture on that. Mm -hmm. And I got a picture of one in here. Um, you know, you can do any pots, any setup. You know, I think it's a picture. <laughs> yeah, we can Maybe. do the picture. Maybe. So. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, I did bring my as long as you put lights on them, if you don't have the adequate light, um, that will that can work as well. So, and I just brought a bunch of different containers you can use. Um, in the winter time, I do this all the time with my kids, either like the pop bottles or like I keep all these salad containers. And the thing that is so nice with them when you have something with a lid is you put the soil in, you put your seed in, and then you just water it and hold it back up until it germinates. Mm -hmm. And then you take it off when they've germinated. So that way it gets the, keeps the humidity in there and keeps the moisture. You know, I do different things. There's like a muffin tin one. Um, some of these other ones are, you know, hinged. And I could put them in, and then you can you can probably prop it a little bit if you want to to give a little air into that. And same with those, you can just set them off to the side. But um, like I said, there's all different things. If you want to do like radishes and stuff, you might want something with a little deeper, so something like 
uh, that or one of these, especially if you want, you can probably do carrots. Mind you got some of the little sharp cut ones. Yeah. No, I do not have holes in the bottom of them. You can make holes in the bottom, or if you want to put some rocks in the bottom of them to, to let it drain to that base, you can do that. But I don't, I just leave them. I don't put holes in the bottom because I don't necessarily have a tray to put underneath there or something. I just kind of watch the watering. How much more have you got? Just pictures. Okay, good. I don't know how long mine will take either. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't time myself. <clears throat> Is there any questions while we're just waiting? How about arugula? Yeah. Can, I mean, if, if, can you plant that now? Will it, how long will it? Um, I think so. I, I planted it well, in my tunnel. I planted it in January even. Because it's a very cold hardy. Yeah. One of the coldest hardy. It seems to be better in the fall. Too. Yeah. Spinach. Uh, what I found was that Bloomsdale long standing is the cold, coldest tolerant spinach. Um, I was surprised to see the late black Dutch cabbage is what they suggested for fall because that's a really long season one. I would, I know that I have some other ones. I know that the colonies mm -hmm. usually will plant those in July, but they'll be harvesting them in probably October, end of September. So. Is the patient going to live? Hope so. Oh, I, hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I can do it without it, but it's fun with the pictures. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't, if it doesn't come up, I do. I did bring the pictures of the pictures that are up there, so maybe we don't have that too. Yeah. yeah. Any leafy greens are really easy to do in the house. Kale is better after it gets hit with a frost. Yeah, and sweeter. It is sweeter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually will keep picking it, and mine actually comes back even in the garden. Mm -hmm. I'll just put a little straw around it. I was going to say in Maryland, it grew year round, all winter long. Yeah. yeah. But here, no. <laughs> Not always. It will in my tunnel. Right. It'll grow all year round. Mm -hmm. We use the good laptop to run the video, so. <laughs> so. I could have brought mine. How many short are they? Maybe I will. <laughs> I'm going to use mine. I just put it on. Yeah, and I charged it. But you still need to find it for mine. Yeah, I know, yes. <laughs> mine doesn't have hers on. No, yeah. yeah. So you need to charge it for hers. So we'll give you, yeah, you should just be able to. I didn't bring it with me. No, I sent it to her. I sent it to the computer, to the library. Yeah, we have. I, I was going to grab my flash drive and I didn't do it. I will have it tonight. <laughs> I will have my laptop tonight. How's that? <laughs> Well, if anybody's interested, they are doing the state 101 planning um, October 28th here. We'll try to get some flex for that. And we're showing uh, where the crawdads sing um, on Sunday the 25th, I believe. That's an excellent movie and an excellent book. We have the books, not right now, but we have copies. So I guess I can talk about my uh, high tunnel a little bit since we're just waiting. I didn't have that on my presentation, but um, in my high tunnel, I will grow tomatoes into January usually um, so that I have them for the market. They do slow down as we get the shorter days. I do not have lights in my, my uh, high tunnel. I do have heat. But I don't have the extra lights, so then that way they, they don't completely um, will say pollinate and um, reproduce, make more fruit, a lot of fruit like they are in the same year. So with the shorter day lengths. Um, but I do a lot of greens in there in the winter time. I do some onions and leeks. Um, 
I don't know. I, I yeah, grow herbs in there year round. Some of them still go dormant, just like they would if they were outside. Like my tarragon and my chives and stuff will just go dormant. That's it's normal, normal habit. Um, you have it again. She's got it up on that one now, done. Yeah, I'll put this in. We have that one. Yeah. Okay. Now, now, we're now we get two laptops. <laughs> <laughs> hey, wire with mine. Ooh, maybe I don't want to bring my laptop. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Never heard of this one. No. So now you just got to go to the end. Oh, there we yep. No now where did it go? <laughs> do you want me to? I can I can do my presentation without it. It's not going to be as cool. But <laughs> <laughs> you want me to start? Because we no, finish the knees and then. There you so there's go. some vertical oh, systems. Oh, there it is. So See, a lot of times, my tower garden. Those are tower gardens. Oh, mine, has, mine has lights. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's little holes in those towers, and you just plug in the plants. They and grow then you in. water at the base. You just water at the base. They grow in um in in rock wool. Rock wool. No, no soil. This is rock wool. Rock wool. Oh, rock wool holds the plants in place, and then um. What happens is is there's water in the bottom it the, a pump pumps it to the top and then it dribbles down over the roots and so you get water and air because the roots need air also and uh like my timer 15 minutes on and 15 minutes off for the well no in the inside it's 15 minutes on and 45 minutes off when you're inside outside it's 15 on 15 off Here's one that um, is like a hydroponic system mm -hmm. on a table. So you can see all these pipes up. <laughs> Close the drop off. Getting ready for the next one. <laughs> so here you can see the tubes and there's little holes they cut in there. Same, same thing, they have like tubes here with the water and they'll send the water and the nutrients through that. This one does have soil in those pipes, it looks like. Um, could also be the rock wool. This one's kind of cute. It's probably in somebody's kitchen. They definitely have a lot of light, unless they have the white background, so it reflects that light and helps. And they have these really cool herbs. I'm guessing they're even drying the herbs in those little sachets. Here's uh, probably what we've seen in the past, is mainly just you can see the lights with the trays, and you can just grow the vegetables there and just cut them off when you need them. And just even some window box, you know, windowsill plantings of herbs works as well. That is all I okay. have. <laughs> Any questions? Finish that off. I'll hand it over to Diana. Hopefully. <laughs> My name is Diana Classy. I am a master, South Dakota master gardener. I was a Maryland master gardener for 10 years before I moved here four years ago. I'm a consulting rosarian uh, trained by the American Rose Society. So my knowledge is really a lot about roses. So we're gonna be working uh, mostly with roses here. Um, and, oh, I'm up. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I get that. This process, what I, that I'm gonna show you with the roses, was published in the American Rose Magazine. Uh, a friend of mine wrote it up for me some years ago, and she started a business with it. She started uh, a business of selling old garden roses, and she started with the method that I'm gonna show you. She eventually grew her business large enough that she did do a greenhouse and all that. So, I don't, I don't like to look up over my shoulder, so I'm going to move this around, hopefully, and not let it come unplugged. Okay. So, for this method, you don't need any fancy equipment. You don't need a greenhouse or grow lights or a heating mat 
or a mister, which is all those kind of things that the the, the, um, the professional rose people use to start their plants. And I have other things other than roses that I started. Now, you have to remember ethics when you propagate. A lot of things, not just roses, but other plants, other semi-living plants have been, have been patented. Those people did a lot of work to hybridize those things. And out of respect for them, you don't want to hybridize. You don't want to do propagating of their roses or their, um, I've, I've done butterfly bushes and ranges. You don't want to do that without their permission. And even if it's not patented, if you know the person that, that did it, try and ask permission. Most patents only last 20 years. So there is a lot of good plants out there that you can propagate without having to worry about patents. <clears throat> um, now I, I made this program in Maryland and there you early fall, but I would say here late summer. I, I've gotten lots of good success from summer cuttings and you'll be able to come out and take a look at them. Okay, you want to, and I've brought a bunch here, you want to take a cutting from a, from a rose, and most of this is roses, that has a spent bloom on it. So this one has a spent bloom on it, because the cane is going to be, or the, in the case of a hydrangea, which I have one here, it had a spent, a bloom on it that was almost spent. The, the stem or the cane is going to have the right maturity to it when you have it that way if you take one that's not open the cane or the stem is going to be really soft and, and not take to rooting as well you need three or you need you need a five or six leaflets so this is a leaf made up leaflet so you want to have a leaf and five or seven leaflets on it so like this one here with two is not so good. So I have this one happens to have one, two, three, four, five. This will work because it has five. And you can do all classifications of, of roses. Uh, the ones I've brought here that you can try and take, take some home and try them. I know they are winter hardy. They have lived outside here at the park for numerous years. Mm -hmm. So if you want to try a rose and it takes, you don't have to do anything special for winterization. It's going to survive here. Okay, here's the supplies you do need. You need a half gallon milk jug, and this one I've already cut, but a half gallon milk jug. I drink the milk. My husband drinks the pop. <laughs> you need that. You need some pruners. A sharp knife or scissors, or both. You can do some root, rooting powder. It's not not necessary. I've rooted with both with with and without it, and a marker to mark when you. I like to mark when I've rooted it, and some good quality potting soil. I'm professional grade. Um, the stuff you get at Walmart might be too heavy. So I like to use Pro Mix or Sunshine Mix or something like that. Where do you get that? This I got from Menards. Mm -hmm. Yep. You can get it from Gurney's, J. Gurney's too. You're going to pay a little bit more there. <laughs> okay, the procedure is you're going to cut the top half off. I've got this almost all the way cut, but you can see. I'll be cutting it the rest of the way. And then you put holes in the bottom. This is your, this is your pot. And you're gonna cut the bottom off the soda bottle. The pot bottom, sorry, I'm still in the East Coast soda there. <laughs> uh, you're gonna make your drain holes. Then you're gonna put your, your moistened potting soil in there. When you get it out of here, it's too dry. You need to make sure it's moistened all the way through. It doesn't need to be soppy wet, good and moistened. And you make a hole in the top. 
where you're going to put your and and I if you come up here you'll see that I have what they call double sticked. So I'll take two of the same rows and put it in the same container because one might make it and one might not. And if they both make it, well, that's a bonus. Okay, so here's my rose king. I'm going to cut off. We didn't show cutting it off, but you remove three of the lower leaves. remove the bloom from the top. Now, this is, I put this one because I knew I had this bent bloom on top. This one is really, I would have let that go a little bit further spent before I cut it. Now you wanna find where, you're, where you took that first leaf off and you're gonna cut it at about a 45 degree angle. And I like to, what you're doing is you're damaging the skin of the cane and that's gonna encourage um, root growth. So I just make, you just kind of, you're just scoring the cane there. And this is not required, I've done it both ways. But once again, if you're removing the prickle, they're not thorns, they're prickles. <laughs> That's another place where you're kind of damaging the skin of the cane. Now, I have done it with root powder, powder and without. Here's something I learned the hard way. Don't put, the, don't put your stem in there because you're gonna contaminate the whole bottle. And when that happens, you open the bottle and it really stinks. Uh -huh. So what I do, and I thought I brought a piece of wax paper, but it, it might still be in my car. I just sprinkle a little bit of this on the, on the wax paper and then just roll the stem around on, in it and, and tap it on the bottom. It's real tempting to just stick it in there. <laughs> but like I said, I ruined a whole, a whole bottle of that. And it's like, oh. And then, you, then you're just going to put this right in there and firm the soil around it. Now, the bottle acts kind of like a greenhouse and it doesn't matter if you take, them, if you take the label off or not. This one just has to have to set the label off, but it's not airtight and you don't want it airtight because then you can, Water or rain will get down in here. I just when I'm when I'm watering these, I just water the top, and the water just slides down and gets into the bottom. You leave the lid on. Leave the lid on. Now, if you want to, and I think I talked about this here. If you want to, and it makes you feel good, you can take the lid off and take your spray bottle and spray it in there. When I first did this, I did that, and then I forget to do it. And it didn't really matter, but it makes you feel good. <laughs> so you, you can you can do that. I then you need the next step is to place it in a protected area. And by protected, this is where I where I root. That is a north facing privacy fence um, on the east side of my house, so it gets a little bit of morning sun, but it doesn't get much because the bench is right there. When I was in Maryland, what I would do is I would put it behind an azalea bush because it would get filtered like from through the azalea bush because you because it could get very hot in here. And and you want you want it somewhere where you're going to remember to water it. Like this summer, I had to I take my little sprinkling can and just water all my bottles. <laughs> now. If it drops leaves, like here's one that's probably not going to make it because it's, especially this one here, it's already brown. This one might because it still has a leaf. And I didn't think, I think I started that about seven weeks ago. But if, if in two weeks you've lost all your leaves, you need to, you need to try again. 
if in two to six weeks your leaves are still there, you still have a chance. If after six weeks, you still got your leaves. Like, um, I think, let me see this one. Uh, that one I started about four weeks. I still don't see any roots yet. If you start seeing growth, um, here's one here that has a little growth on it. That's that's a really good sign, but the best sign is roots on the bottom. This one has roots on the bottom. I'm not sure if you can see, they're just fine little, that's why I like the milk jugs, because I can see the roots on the bottom. And you can see them even better up there. So that's when you celebrate. <laughs> now, if you could see what I, I'm, I'm really a um, stickler about, even though this is a milk jug, I like to put the name of whatever this is and the date I did it, because when it's time to take this out, I put it along the corners here and I'll show you. I, I don't think I have a picture of that because you just want to lift it out. You don't have to save this milk jug. You've recycled and it's already served its purpose. So cut it apart. But I like to cut this piece out here and that's my plant label for a little while. So I know what I what it is. Okay. If here you want to overwinter them probably on a windowsill. I said in Maryland, I could overwinter them outside and they would get snow. In fact, I loved it when they got snow because I knew that under the needs of snow, it was about 30 degrees. It was kind of, it kind of insulated it. So here you want to put it in a, in a window. If you have grow lights, you can do that. I do put mine downstairs near my grow lights. And when the, when the, Danger when the all you know, like April, end of April, that's when you want to take it outside. You cut the milk jug. I have people trying to save the milk jug. Don't do that. Like I said, take your scissors and you just cut along the side so you can just lift, lift the plant out. And you put it in a larger pot. And then you must harden it off because it is basically in a greenhouse. It's protected. It's not, so you harden it off. So it's getting used to the sun and the wind and anything else that might come. <clears throat> and the way I like to harden off is I find a tree that's starting to, to leaf out. And I put the put it up against, put the pot, not that's a bigger pot than this, probably something like this, up against the tree. And each day I move it a little bit further out from the trunk until it's all the way out from underneath the tree and so then it's by that time it's pretty much used to the sun and the wind okay and i did talk about oh i wanted to say if you all watched uh, gardening hour a couple weeks ago uh rhoda barrows said that you could do cuttings of grapes like this but you would take the cuttings in february oh. yeah so i guess that's right before the plant's going to wake up I've not tried that, but if I find someone that has grapes, I might give it a try. And then you can also do propagating by water. Um, I have a geranium here that took, and I love to do violets. Mm -hmm. But I've never tried the herbs, but just I cut this out about 10 days ago. This is basil, and it didn't take long to root. I'm going to try it with some of my rosemary that I want to bring inside. So now's a good time to do that. The, your favorite herbs that you know won't make it through the winter, take cuttings of them. Oh, cool. uh, and that is my roses. <laughs> well, that was my roses in Maryland. Here's how I went to garden. This is, this is the, the tower garden she was talking about. Right now, my tower garden looks kind of like this, where I just have little seedlings in it. But I, 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 you can grow a tower garden outside. Uh, it takes a lot more water. <laughs> so we decided that we grow our tower garden in the winter 
inside with greens with lettuces and mm -hmm. spinach and kale we, we really enjoy kale so uh it was a it was a, a housewarming gift from my children when we moved here because mm -hmm. they both know i like to garden <laughs> and like i said the way it works is this is full of water and it, and nutrients you 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 put liquid nutrients in there and the water pumps up to the top and just trickles down over the the at first it's just rock wall that's keeping moist but then at the end at the end of the season you open that thing up and it's just packed full of roots and what's interesting is when it really gets big you have to reach in the bottom part and pull the roots out of the water because it they'll they'll gum up the pump <laughs> so you think i'm killing them but you're just reaching and pulling out a whole bunch of roots and getting them out of there but the plants don't seem to mind and I have a friend that does winter stratification with uh, flower seeds that need to have that. She's she's into a lot of um, native plants and stuff, and there's some that need to have winter stratification. And she, I have not done it, but she's going to teach me how to do that this, this winter. But here's a, a just a quick idea of what what she does. You, you take a gallon milk jug and you cut it, and you put your seeds in there. And she has them out all winter. You go out there and they're they're out in her because they need that pole to to germinate in the spring. And she says, don't use duct tape. It's too sticky. You've got to use painter's tape. <laughs> <laughs> because you do open it up and, and uh, wire it and whatever. So if y'all know coral, she's a native plant nut. She's gonna, she says she's gonna win me over. So what I have brought for anybody who is interested is I have half gallon milk jugs over here. And I have the, the, the pop bottles. Oh, this one's not cut all the way because that's my example. And I have quite a few stems of spent looms. Well, this one's not very spent, but that have several leaves of multiple leaflets that you can take home and try. I don't have any potting soil for you, but so if, if you want to at the end, you can help yourself to that. Uh, any questions for me or for, <laughs> or for Cindy? Yes. Just propagating is taking more plants, right? Yes, yes. If you see this one, this one, this one I started in June and it already has a bud. Wow. Well, what do you know about starting rose hips like this? With you, when you do rose hips, they need to be cold stratified. So that means you need to either put them into your refrigerator or you need, and they need to be two or three weeks. The thing is, you don't know what you're going to get because you don't know where the bee has pollinated from. And that's that's how hybridizers do that. They 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 purposely cross cross two different kinds of roses. But if you just take a rose hip from your yard, you don't know what you're going to get. And I've had rose hips um, root, and you get the weirdest little flowers. <laughs> you know, so you can that's that's a real fun game to play. Like I said, and from that rose hip, you can have multiple seeds, and each seed could be a different plant. And usually you want to start bring seeds after you cold stratify them. You want to start them in like a sand mixture because they are going to be really susceptible to um, the, the funguses that will, you know, like dampening off and stuff like that. They're very susceptible to that. So a lot of people, they might start them in something like this and then put like a quarter of an inch cover of sand over the top to stop the, any fungus that might affect them but you do grow those under lights and you do miss them a lot mm -hmm. sounds complicated and that's why you want to honor the patents because those hybridizers um i have a friend in maryland that's a hybridizer and he will start like 300 seeds and from those 300 seeds he might continue on with 25 of them mm -hmm. and of those 25 that he continues on there might be one or two that's worth 
putting onto the market. So they really work hard to do that. And so that's why, and the same is true about any plant where a hybridizer has come up with a new variety. They do a lot of work to get there. And so when they patent it, and it's expensive to patent a, a flower, a plant. So when they do all that, you want to you want to honor their hard work by going and buying their plant instead of um, rooting it. Now, what I do is if I have bought the plant and the plant I have, that's what I did with this one here. The plant I have is not doing well. And I'm worried that it's not going to make it through the winter this winter. So I did take a cutting of it and root it because I don't want to lose that plant. Well, what about growing sweet potato, the ornamented sweet potato? I took some branches, put them in water, and they just started rooting like crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not like I need to start over, so I wasn't paying attention. But you know, sometimes those those ornamental sweet potatoes make potatoes, and you can save that and, and try and grow that again next year. They're not supposed to, but I know I've seen it. Taste that. very good though. No, you don't want to eat them, but just save them for the next year so you can grow your ornamental potatoes again. So can I grow my ornamental potato once I get the roots? Can I just stick it in one of my pots inside? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have those big kind that I can just plant it in there. Mm -hmm. And it will it doesn't have to be stratified or whatever. Mm -hmm. Not I even put them in the garage and they've come back. So, you know, if it gets a nice bulb on your pot, I put my pots in the inside somewhere in a garage or whatever and pull them back out. Those plants surprisingly came back because they, they just didn't get cold enough. Those tubers and the tubers started growing again. What about um, planting irises now? You know, the tubers. You have to start roots on them, or you just throw them in the ground. And usually, you would have somebody. I mean, if you know somebody that has them, you just divide them. You could plant them this year, or wait till spring. Yeah, I don't think better. I don't know. I don't know. Irises, I don't think they're kind of hard to kill, so <laughs> I think you can do it any time. They don't need roots. Nutrients are in the Take take the the new ones are around the outside. Those rhizomes. The, the old ones that are going to be dead and cruddy are, you know, as they spread out in your uh -huh. soil, yeah, they make the you don't want to use the old ones in the middle. You want to use the new ones on the outside. And yeah, just kind of half plant them. I mean, they like months. to be, yeah, above uh, grass. Yeah, they, they don't want to be completely covered up, uh -huh. but you can do it now. Okay. Uh, if anyone is interested, I do have. I do have a very few handouts of my talk. I've got like six, so if you're only come and get one if you're really interested in giving it a try. Oh, this method is highly addictive. I had a friend in Maryland. I showed, I did this talk, and his wife came up to me a year later and she said, I can't even get to my kitchen window because my husband has so many of those. Uh, <laughs> And, and the success rate is is probably around 80 to 90 percent. So if I do if I do 10, one or two may not make it. And then what do you do with them after they've gotten? To You're gonna you put them in your yard or? If, if what I what I like to do with my roses, my new roses, is I for the first year I like to grow them in pots at least you know, until about this time, and then you can put them out to the ground or just keep, you know, I have an attached garage so I can put my pots in the garage and then in the spring I can plant them, plant them out. A lot of the roses I have, I brought from Maryland, so they live in containers all the time and they overwinter in my garage, but I do have some that are zone four hardy <laughs> and they do stay outside. And these are zone four hardy. So if you wanna try one of these, um, you have, and, and, and they succeed in growing, they will live outside for you. What, what kind of rows are they, do you know? These are the ones that were down at the park. Okay. Okay, so they're all shrub roses. Mm -hmm. Some of them, uh, one of them has 
what we would call in in the rose world, this is called a single because it only has a few petals. But um, you know, these are all ones that have grown out at the park for years. So I know that they are South Dakota hardy. <laughs> I'm sure that, well, the thing is, we don't know what their names are. So we would not be able to tell you. All said thing that they had during in the spring or something in the in the prairie garden. He said that the best group of roses were here in the Midwest in in South Dakota was um, ones that are named after explorers from the uh, northeast um, hmm. state, like Hudson hmm. and some of those guys that have you ever heard of those names? Uh, no, because um, mm -hmm. now see, I've I, the ones I grow outside, several of them have been hybridized by a gentleman in, in Iowa who's no longer living. Um, I can't, his name's not coming to me, I'll have to write it down. But he has he has hybridized one called Earth Girl or Earth Song. I grow that one. Um, Buck, I don't know what his last name is. My first name is his first name is Buck. He he hybridized a lot of roses in Iowa that are that are very hardy for the plains. So I've I've grown some of his. If you want to just play around with roses, I'm not going to tell you to buy them from this company, but um, there's a company out of Denver called High Country Roses. If you go to their website, what is so great is you can click on zone four roses or zone three roses and all that will come up will be just roses that will survive in zone three or zone four or and so you can you can shop with confidence that that rose is going to survive in our zone now i know officially we are zone five but if you go up 10 miles north we're in zone four so i would recommend you go with zone four roses or even i grow some zone three roses which i know are going to survive here. <laughs> these, these, these are. I, um, I'm not a hybridizer, but I am a discoverer. Uh, the pink one and this yellow one here, they're both sports that I have registered. The pink one is called Classy Lady, uh -huh. and the yellow one is called Classy Sunrise. A sport is where something happens with the plant and it changes color. So when you discover a sport, you you have to be good at, at rooting it because you're going to cut it and you root it, and then you grow it and you cut it and you root it. You do that for three generations, and if it doesn't revert back, then you can register it. Oh. And it's not patented, <laughs> but it's not a zone four rose, and those are not zone four roses. And you call that a what? Huh? It's a sport. Oh, sport. It's a color sport. So, um, uh, that's not it. The one that's not making it is the dish. <laughs> yeah, I did have a sport that sported white from an apricot rose and it did go, it reverted back. So, I was not able to register that. And I did have another sport, but I didn't like the color, so I didn't register. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for a great yeah. presentation. Really and we'll be back next month with presentation of our pros with Marlis and um, we should have lots of good stuff to eat after that, right? <laughs> okay, thank you all for coming. And I'll be in a bad keep in mind the boss presentation so we find out the latest and greatest or depressing news on the internet. Or... <laughs> all right. well, and come and get some.